I have a small shift for fake it till you make it. I believe you face it till you make it. We all had pretty fucked up childhoods, okay? Maybe not everyone, but I would say to a certain degree, everyone kind of had a fucked up childhood. Trauma's universal. Yeah, it's universal, man. Some of the most fucked up childhoods is people who had everything. I was just gonna say that. I wouldn't want that existence. Fuck that. I like this shit way better. When you're born, you kind of have a clean slate. So what you're doing is you're looking to form your subconscious. So you're just looking around for evidence in your environments and experiences and you're looking to your caregivers, the environments around you, you're looking, who am I? Who am I in this world? God bless my parents. They worked around the clock just barely to get by. I'm a product of them. The story that I was telling myself in my self-concept of who I believe myself to be was very small. Most people, if you are asleep, you are going to become that because our subconscious just wants to validate our internal beliefs in the external world. Step outside of that and say, the story that I'm telling myself of who I believe myself to be is is not the truth. I'm so much more than that. It's a powerful topic, but I think it aligns with so many people when they make a decision to step into a person that, that maybe historically they are not. That imposter oftentimes wins that battle. I hate this self-love, all this bullshit about you are enough. What do you mean I'm enough? If I believe I'm enough, what's the motivation and catalyst to get me off my fucking couch and actually do something in this world? If you actually love yourself, then prove it. Hey, you guys got my dear friend here, Kaylor Betts. Kaylor is a dear friend who's one of the greatest voices, I think, in America. Um, if you're looking for one of the best life and business coaches in America, this is the guy for you. But if you're really looking to be awakened to what's really happening in this country, this is the guy for you. Some of the content that I've seen that is the most sticky in my mind has actually come from Kaylor Betts. So, Kaylor, welcome to Man on a Mission, brother. Yeah, thanks for having me, brother. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, this will be fun. It was cool getting on your show. Now it's it's, it's neat having you on, on mine. But um, I want to dig right in because um, this country, I think, needs men like you to start stepping up to the plate. I think there's a lot of guys out there that have a lot of potential to sort of wake up, um, as you would put it. But they may historically have not. And I'm hoping that maybe that trend is, is stopping. Why do you think so many men in America... Um, that have good hearts, that are good fathers, that are good men, historically over the last 20 years have been so silent as they slowly watch like freedom from our perspective get eroded. Man, that is a <clears throat> big question. Look, I think we live in a time for the first time in human history where survival is not enough. So for most of human history, survival was success. Right, like for, for almost all of human history, up until just a fraction of the totality of human history, uh, let's say maybe the last 50 years or so, could we actually dare and be so bold to actually strive for more than just survival, right. right? Most of human history was just literally wake up and it's like, how do I keep myself and my family safe? That's it. And now we live in an environment where it's pretty easy to survive, you know, granted that you're in, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably in the, the, the West or you're in a, a safe country, right? So now, how do I relate that to your question? You know, why are so many people asleep? And it's because they're running off that survival program and conditioning that we all have within us. Eric, we are all wired strictly just for survival our subconscious mind which we run off of 90 to 95 percent of the time which is where 90 to 95 percent of our thoughts actions ideas and emotions come from there's an anti you inside of you there's an anti abundance inside of you that wiring that we run off of it doesn't care about your vision board that has your g-wagon on there and you're you know i want to make 10k a month or you know whatever it is that's on your vision board it doesn't care about that. All it cares about is the familiar. It wants to be able to, you know, predict the future. It wants to keep you safe, comfortable, and small. Mm. Okay? So it's this anti-you. It's trying to dim your light. And if you don't wake up to that conditioning, then you don't have the ability to respond to that conditioning. Okay? And here's the thing is there's numerous stages of awakening. Stage one is to understand the enemy in the external world, all your opponents in the external world. This is 
the government. This is gas prices, inflation. This is the WEF. This is the the Bill Gates, the George Soros is, you know, this is all the people that are trying to infringe on your rights and freedoms and has an agenda that doesn't line up with your f- true freedom. But that's only like 10 to 20% of it. And so many people are stuck in the quote unquote awake community. Mm. So many people are just stuck there. Right. They just stop at stage one. Stage two is to awaken to the actual problem, which the only thing that can be a real problem for your freedom is guess what? You, the only thing that can get in the way is you. So, so stage two of awakening is to awaken to what are the patterns, the internal wiring and conditioning that I'm talking about right now, that anti you, what are your patterns that are limiting you and keeping you safe, small and comfortable that actually would choose a familiar hell over an unfamiliar heaven? Mm right? Stage three of awakening, because that's not enough as well, too. We might be aware and awake to the external opponents. We may be aware of the real problem, all those internal patterns and wiring. But if we don't do anything about it, well, then nothing happens. Like Alex Hormozzi says, learning doesn't occur unless behavior changes, right? So stage three is to be awake to the actions and the behavior that you need to take to actually get to where you truly want to be and and what you truly desire and where your freedom actually lies. So that's stage three. Stage four, which, I mean, we can talk about, it's not really my shtick, although I do not want to underestimate its importance. It might be the most important one. I believe it is the most important one. Stage four is to awaken to a greater and higher intelligence, that something within you is connected to something greater than you, right? God. So those are the four stages of awakening. Now, to just bring it back full circle, the last thing, Eric, when you asked why are so many Mm -hmm. men and as people in general in this time so asleep? Well, it's just how we're wired, Mm -hmm. man. We're just wired for like just being comfortable, being able to predict the future because it may not make me happy. Well, your wiring doesn't care about your happiness, but at least I know what I'm going to get. That's how your wiring thinks is it's like I just want to be able to stay safe small and comfortable that's why I believe so many people are asleep because it takes courage to wake up to that and then actually fucking do something Mm. about it that was a great answer like you went four levels deep where most people can only (laughs) go one and you I mean you pushed the boundaries with that answer you said something that I loved I have to just highlight it because I think that this is uh, something that will land in a lot of people's hearts this idea of a familiar hell that you're, that is a known thing versus the unfamiliar heaven that could be, but you don't know it. And so you're going to stay stuck in hell because it's familiar. That may have been one of the greatest sort of lines in connection with a powerful question of why are so many people sleep, particularly men is who I'm focusing on right now, knowing that like masculinity is, is one of the things that's kept sort of civilizations thriving, growing, kept them free. And, it, and um, it's a really powerful component towards the uh, sort of expanse of humanity, in my opinion. And it's being assaulted as it should be if this was a chess game and I'm on this side trying to really, um, you know, play the game that I feel like is clear as day is being played out in America. But that is so good. That is just powerful. What a question. Yeah, man. Look, th- that's just it. If you understand that you are wired for a familiar hell, now let's just break that down a little bit more. What does that really mean? That means that your psychology will actually choose something that doesn't like a life and a reality and circumstances that don't actually align with your highest potential and highest quality of life. It'll actually choose that because it's familiar. Why familiar? Well, because familiarity equals a higher chance of survival. It familiarity equals less threats. So again, your wiring is like, well, it may not make me happy, but at least I know what I'm going to get. And that's why people will self sabotage. That's why people will throw away things that actually align with their greatest and highest potential, because it's unfamiliar. That's why people will literally go to work, especially men, they'll wake up in the morning, they'll go to a job that doesn't actually serve them. They're unfulfilled. They know they're not really useful to the world, at least to the extent that they could be, right? And they go just to get a paycheck, okay? They're living under their potential, but it's familiar. They were conditioned by society that that's the safe thing to do, when in actuality, it's the most risky thing to do. Then they come home, they drink a couple beers, they think about how they should be going to the gym, and maybe they'll start on Monday, and they fight with their wife, they 
try and be present with their kids, but they're probably on their phones because they're lighting the pleasure centers up of their brain because they need a little bit of that hit of dopamine. And then they're eating a meal that they know they shouldn't eat. Okay. Probably things that also light the pleasure centers up of their brain. They're using food as entertainment. And then they go to sleep and they wake up and they do it all over again. And they're waiting for the weekends when they can escape their life and numb all the internal pain that they're dealing with and wait for their two, maybe three weeks vacation a year that they can. And, and that's the familiar hell. At least it's familiar. And what they're so afraid of, understandably so, no shame or judgment. I was stuck in this cycle forever. But what they're so afraid of is breaking out of that familiar pattern because it's uncertain. And what if they fail, right? That's a scary thing that you got to have courage for. But I don't believe you can really call yourself a man if you don't step outside of that mediocrity that we're being sold. We're being sold a life that, quite frankly, just makes you fat, sick, tired, weak, and broke. And if you don't step outside of that and have the courage to do it, I don't think you can call yourself a man. Mm -hmm. I'm just being very straight up. Yeah, this is powerful. I mean, this is everything right here. I just um, have been battling this topic of what is winning, and I think you just answered it, like what actually winning really looks like. I'll, one of the places that I, that I took that question was this fuel, this, this, this almost dark fuel that, that burns inside people that, that from, from my perspective, that, that operate at the highest levels in life. Oftentimes you'll find that beneath the winning is sort of this fuel that created tunnel vision and focus and, and really like... Um, it never really comes from a place of love or it never comes from a place of purpose or meaning at first. It always starts of a place of fuck you, these chips on the shoulder. It's, it's, it is hell that propels action. Um, and so as I really chopped the topic up, I realized most of, of winning comes from some of the most negative emotions in the beginning. It's only when you finally had enough or, or it's only when you figure out how to take all that child uh, hatred that you might have had for your alcoholic father who was, a, whatever your story is, it's sort of, winning is embedded in the story and how you converted all the pain into fuel. That's my perspective, but you put this beautiful cherry on top. What is, uh, what is something someone should do that if they're listening to this and, and they realize that you just described their life, they're playing Call of Duty, they're fucking around after their nine to five, they and not doing anything that moves the needle in life, not living a profound life, definitely not living at their highest and best use, where would someone start to try to figure out how to tap into this stuff that we're talking about? Yeah, so I want to go back to winning. I'm going to answer your question, but let's talk about winning, okay? Because awesome. I think we got to be crystal clear on really what that is. And sure, I've kind of, I think we've alluded to it, but <laughs> here's the deal. First, I think the best way to really clarify what winning is, is to actually talk about what I believe losing to be in life. Losing, so the opposite of winning, would actually be to align your actions and your behaviors with that wiring and conditioning, to align your actions and your behaviors with how you feel in the moment, okay? And we all have that anti-you inside of us. We all have those insecurities, our shadow, our ego. We all have wounds from our environments and our experiences in our childhood. Like you mentioned, your alcoholic father, if you had an alcoholic father and you were abandoned by him and you felt rejected for your whole life, well, then you got to understand that that's your internal program. Mm. That's your familiar hell. And there's some chaos internally. Now you have two choices. You can unconsciously react to those. So again, losing is doing and aligning your actions and your behaviors with how you feel. If you had that experience, you're probably going to feel like lashing out on your wife a lot or your kids because there's a lot of anger inside because you were abandoned and rejected. And you're probably very afraid of your wife and your kids abandoning and rejecting you as silly sure. as it sounds. So that would be losing. Winning would be the opposite. Winning would be to not align your actions and behaviors with how you feel but with your long-term values and commitments, you want to know what fucking winning is? Winning is aligning your behaviors and your actions with who you say you are and what you want out of this life. And if your actions and your behaviors actually align with that, then I believe you're winning. Simple as that. And it's to not unconsciously react to those internal patterns that are going to limit you and all the anger inside but it, and the fear. But it's to align your actions and your behaviors by consciously responding. So it's to observe those and to say, ah, I had an alcoholic father, I have a lot of anger. It's to become conscious of those internal patterns. And we have this beautiful thing as humans, we have a superpower, we can actually feel fear, we can feel anger. 
and we can actually consciously observe it. And as Viktor Frankl says, our freedom lies between stimulus and response. So in between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space you lies your ability to choose to respond. So you can respond in a different way. Okay, and if you do that enough with enough repetition, the wiring changes and you slowly start to become a different person. Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about this all the time. So go back to your question. What would someone do? Tolerable steps. Okay, again, we are obsessed with the familiar hell. So you can't do anything too unfamiliar. You can't step zero to 100. Okay. What is the tolerable step? You got to look for low risk opportunities to slowly step into the unfamiliar heaven that you are destined to step into. And you got to first define who do you want to be in this world? Alex Ramosi says you build confidence by building a stack of undeniable proof that you are who you say you are. So you got to first define who are you? Who do you want to be in this world? What were you put on this fucking earth to do? What are you optimizing for? What do you want out of this life? Define that clearly and then slowly but surely with tolerable steps, make conscious decisions despite how you feel towards who you actually are and what you want out of this life. And that's the first step. Yeah, that's such a good answer. And, and um, that book, Man's Search for Meaning, you, you referenced Victor Frankl. And, uh, you know, there's some powerful thoughts that, that, that align out of that. One of these ideas that like... Um, for meaning, I remember how you find meaning in life. It, it really, I think he said it was by the attitude um, that you take towards unavoidable suffering. And I just love that perspective um, because I think people that, like I was, for so long I told myself a story. I'm sure you did. I'm sure there's people listening that, 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 will, that will agree with this, but you've told yourself a story that it is a lie. Um, I always thought, oh, well, he must have been born that way. What a cop out, right? Not realizing that once I became friends and I got inside that person's world, they had the same fears that I did. They, their, their reality was the exact same in many instances as mine, but I told myself the wrong story. Maybe I, I, I didn't sort of light up the right fuel source, if you will. That's the best way that I re really describe it. But um, this idea of, of becoming the person and, and that you want to be, this is a cool question too, and this is something that, Here's what's funny. When I hear some of the best stories I've ever heard, what I oftentimes hear in the story is fake it till you make it, in a sense. And it's kind of a cool topic because in many cases, I, I argue, even with the right fuel source, it's like a genius play. Like, become it before you are and then just be it forever. <laughs> and it's sooner or later, like, the stack that you just mentioned with Hermosi sort of becomes the reality. But dress the part, look the part, be the part. You have a lot of people talk shit about it. But even within some of those people's same stories, they, they started playing the game. Ed Milet's my mentor, and I love his story of, like, fearing that if they figure him out, it's over. The whole thing will be over if they figure out who he really is. It's a powerful topic, but I think it aligns with so many people when they make a decision to step into a person that, that maybe historically they are not. That sort of imposter oftentimes wins that battle, and you're grappling with this idea of, of fake it till you make it. And in the world of social media, all we hear is about authenticity, blah, 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 and I... I wonder what your take on is on this broad sort of, you know, huge thing that I just kind of left you. Well, I have a small shift for fake, fake it till you make it. Okay. <clears throat> I believe you face it till you make it. Mm. Okay. So here's why. Remember I mentioned the anti you. Mm. That is the story of who you believe yourself to be. Now, we all had pretty fucked up childhoods. Okay. Maybe not everyone but i would say to a certain degree everyone kind of had a fucking trauma is universal Why? trauma is universal yeah it's universal yeah. and birth is a trauma you know so <laughs> sure. look you have to understand that everyone to a certain degree even if look even you want to know who had some of the most fucked up childhoods is people rich who kids. had everything yeah rich kids yeah yeah i was just like, gonna say that like i wouldn't want that existence fuck that i like this shit that'll, way better that'll fuck you up yeah. so here's the thing is we got to understand when you're born, you kind of have a clean slate. Yes, there's generational trauma and all that stuff. But for the most part, you have a clean slate. So what you're doing is you're looking to form your subconscious. So you're just looking around for evidence in your environments and experiences. And you're looking to your caregivers, the environments around you, you're looking, who am I? Mm. Who am I in this world? And we all had a little bit of a fucked up childhood. God bless my parents. You know, um, they, they had great intentions, but they didn't have a manual of how to raise me, right? Sure. So 
you know, they said a lot of things to me that instilled this belief and they worked around the clock just barely to get by. So I viewed them as, well, I'm a product of them. So the story that I was telling myself in my self-concept of who I believe myself to be was very small, okay, and limiting. So it's to recognize that most people, if you are asleep, you are going to become that because our subconscious just wants to validate our internal beliefs in the external world. That's all it wants to do. So it's to step outside of that and say, the story that I'm telling myself of who I believe myself to be is not the truth. It's not. Yeah. I'm so much more than that. Okay. And that's why I hate this self love, body positivity, all this bullshit about you are enough, you know? And it's like, yeah. what do you mean I'm enough? If I believe I'm enough, what's the motivation and catalyst to get me off my fucking couch and actually do something in this world? How about the message of, you can be so much more. And if you actually love yourself, then prove it. Mm. Go out and actually show up and do things that align with your highest potential, a potential that you actually might even cross into beyond what you even imagined you could be, right? Yeah. That's the message I put out there. And to, to go back to the face it till you make it, that's what I mean is like you are going to have to understand that you have this limiting story of who you think you're you are based on your past experiences and that you can be so much more so then you're going to have to face a lot of fears because you're going to have to step into the unfamiliar you're going to have to actually break that story and that narrative of who you are who you believe yourself to be sorry and step into who you say you are and then you align your actions and behavior with that and you're going to have to face a lot of fears and you know how much self-confidence is on the other side of your greatest fears in fact all your freedom it's right there lies yeah. beyond your greatest fears i use dragons a lot like in my brand i just love like scary dragons because it's sort of a visual representation i use for like if you want the gold you just got to face the dragon and there's no gold that has any kind of um like value in the world that's worthwhile that doesn't have some big dragon guarding it I love the symbolism uh, be, uh, behind that message, and it, it really goes back to you know mythology, but uh, like the use of a dragon, very iconic thought. You want the princess peaches, like well, you're gonna have to fight through Bowser at his castle. You know what I mean? I just love that. So, it's it's one of the ways that sort of I've I've almost gamified a situation, and I, this has been effective for me. Maybe it will be for my audience. Maybe you can add to it, but. I naturally started doing this when I started winning. And one of the things that I did is I didn't realize I was sort of practicing so stoicism. I had no idea what that even was for so many years. You know, Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, I think, are really genius mindsets that sort of help curate like a mindset that is so geared to win um, because it's really about emotions and our connection to them. But the second I started playing chess, like with every decision, and I realized even if something terrible happens to me that like where my rage starts, you could feel it. Like you said, uh, it's a feeling like uh, anxiety, pressure, stress, like a fear. You physically feel it. To be able to have a system that you rely on that just becomes like a trigger pop, and pulls you back for just a hot second is I just need one breath and I think about a chess table. What ends up happening for me, Kayla, and for people listening, for me personally, is I instantly am not surprised anymore by, by the action that just happened against me. In fact, I expect it. Why? Because that's the universe's job is to fuck me over. Its job is to play a good chess move. And that, now that it just landed a good one, it almost allows me to like, damn, good move. Like, mm, okay. But you see how all of a sudden the power is in my corner now? It's because you called it earlier. It's my decision. I hope that helps someone out there. I love gamifying life. And all it does in my mind is takes this negative emotions off the table and allows me to play the game. And what I found is some of the biggest catastrophes are littered with 10x opportunities. Some of the greatest gold is in the problem itself. Like, so I almost like embrace failure as part of the game so that the scar tissue sort of I develop in the process is what one day really is, is it, again, it, I, that's the shit that makes you unfuckable with. Been there, done that, seen it all. I will, now I know how to handle this, that, and the other. But just that simple idea of, of gamification. I don't know if you have any system or Marcus Aurelius sort of add-ons that you'd want to put there, but... I think that will help a lot of people. In fact, I've seen it help a lot of people already. Yeah, the most powerful mental framework to win is to look at challenges and failures and all the adversities of life on a long enough time horizon. Those are just tests, right? Those are really just tests. This is a game, right? And I think people struggle with when I say that sometimes because right. when I say it's a game, 
they almost think that I'm like undermining its weight and importance. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. No. I'm just saying it's a game in that they're, you're, you're playing their strategy. You either do the right thing or the wrong thing. And then on a long enough time horizon, there's real consequences. Absolutely. This is the most profound game that we'll ever play. Um, you either win or you lose and you either get consequences that are going to serve you or that are going to be a disservice. And I think that's a beautiful thing to look at life that way in that like every decision is going to compound and the compound effect is very real. Every decision is going to compound over and over and we're all in the place we're at and we all have the circumstances and reality that we live in because of the previous decisions we've made and people get very triggered by that as well too because they're like you know but i know i'm a victim like i you know like this happened to me and that happened to me and it's like yeah i'm not suggesting that there's never um a situation where you're a victim of circumstance that that there's never something in the external world that's outside of your control but we're not a victim of circumstance as much as we're a victim of our perspective Mm. and our behavior Mm. on the response that we have to those things. Damn. So that's what we're really a victim of. And it's not the external circumstance. And quite frankly, wherever you point your finger is where you're giving away your power and your responsibility. So if you say it's the government's fault or it's the my boss or inflation or the WEF or whatever, you're literally giving away your power and that makes you weak. And guess what? That's what they actually want because only the weak can be controlled. So if you don't want to be controlled and you want freedom, then take your fucking power back and realize that the only thing that can get in the way is your perspective and your response to things, right? Going back to Viktor Frankl, yeah. you talked about authenticity. People think authenticity is like just being you, right? And it's like, no, if I was just me, I would probably be that anti you. I'll give you an example. I have, as many people do, people pleasing tendencies, right? Like I was conditioned in my childhood to believe that the way in which you get love care and attention in this world is to please the people around you and the more you please the people around you the more love and care and attention that you get which is ultimately what we at a deep-seated level want it's survival right so like for me i have a tendency to just like infringe on my needs and put those on a bat on the back burner stuff them under the rug and just please someone around me and and give them what their wants and desires and needs are and that would me that would be me if that's authenticity being hmm. just do what naturally is you that would then be authenticity me too that's not authenticity i i also there's the opposite where like one of my values is kindness right i want to be kind to people especially like uber drivers or people who are you know delivering your food Love if you this. like be, be kind even when it's difficult so if I get in an Uber and he takes the wrong turn and I'm a little bit behind, everything inside of me that naturally comes up will want me to yell at him. God damn it. Yeah. But that but yeah, exactly. But that's not being authentic. No. What authenticity really is, is it's defining what are your values and who do you want to be in this that's world? Gold. What do you want of this life? And then aligning with it. Yeah. That's authenticity. Yeah. Okay. So authenticity in that moment when I'm in the Uber would be to Mm. understand my natural inclination to yell at this guy or get mad and to consciously recognize that that would be going against who I say I am and what my values are. And it would actually be the authentic choice to instead, as hard as it is, to emotionally regulate through that situation and to actually still be kind and recognize that it's not that fucking big of a deal if I'm a few minutes late. Right. You know what, I mean, you're covering so much gold right here that is like some of the most effective, like winning small moments is is everything in life. And they compound over a day, a week, a month, a year, a lifetime, your your outcomes, even in a year with, when, with winning small moments in the cab. Like, man, you know, what's funny is like who I've become, even in my own story is I make my bed when I leave a hotel room. Now, I don't expect everyone else. I don't look down if you don't, but I've created this standard in my mind that is just like, I want to show respect. I always leave a note, a loving note and a $20 bill. Like, it's just like, I know you're doing this job and I'm a messy fuck. And like, let me show you, I care. It's a standard, but you know how, like when you become it and it becomes something, it's a non-negotiable, you end up feeling good as a human over it. I'm almost like correcting my wrongs 
from my childhood. And it's just a cool thing to get to this place. Like, but these are all decisions, but it's more than that. You just tapped into it. In my mind, it's the power of feeling the emotion and going the direction that you want, like setting the sail the direction you want, regardless of which way the wind is coming. That is a hard thing for most people to do. And in fact, many times we still fail with great intentions. We still may fail, but it's being able to course correct as quick as possible in the next moment and not letting this moment trickle down into 10 more but it's all emotions. It's this emotional regulation of like whatever is authentic. Yeah, I think you, you tapped into that so good. And you said something that I got to, I just think it was gold. It says the you said the victim of, pers- of perspective. That, that was one of the most powerful sort of, you may have phrased it a little differently, but sort of like you're a victim to your perspective is a much better way to describe the reality of someone's actual situation than being the victim of their circumstance. You can't say a better word than that. And I have to give this tip that is golden. It may be morbid to most, to many people. I put death into almost every profound decision, including waking up in the morning. When I get out of bed, I literally think about my coffin. And it was a, it was a habit that used to be almost unhealthy when my grandma died. Like I might've even talked about it with you on your podcast, but what's happened in my mind is it shifted perspective from the start of the day. And I look at my wife differently. She has a completely different glow when I think about death. Her dying, what if she died? Everything changes when you can force yourself into a new perspective and problems get smaller, they get funnier even, they get weak. The ones that have power over you often are not the big ones. A lot of times they're the small little ones. And again, like if you could bring death into every single powerful decision, it changes the outcome. It changes how you communicate. It changes the frequency, the energy. And bro, I might just hug you and just hold that hug a little longer. Kayla, if I'm in your presence and I'm like, man, this is a good man. What if he's going to get hit by a car tomorrow and not make it? Just dumb shit. Like it allows me to be where my feet are in the moment. And I give, I bleed harder. It served me so well. And it's been, death has been one of the greatest gifts to my life. And at first it was one of the greatest detriments. And I would argue it it led me to some of the greatest people I've ever met. And it led me to God himself. It actually was that the connection of God that might've been missing most of my life. Well, how many people are just not showing up? (laughs) Like they've never shown up for themselves before. Yeah because they don't meditate on their death. I mean, it's a very stoic principle, right? No. Memento mori, right? So it's That's like, right. if we all had a, and there's books on this about how a, a near death experience changes you, right? Or at least it should, right? Mm. Anyone in their right mind, because it puts things into perspective. One of the best frameworks of how to make really good decisions to me is the, the rocking chair strategy, where you just if you're faced with a tough decision or even just a smaller decision, but you're a little bit torn on it, just picture yourself on a rocking chair at 95 years old and the end is almost near. And it's like, what would that version of you who has way more perspective on what is important and, and really knows, you know, what decision you should make, what would they say about the decision? It's as simple as that. I mean, and, and, and I can't tell you how many times I've made a very quick decision undeniably like un unwaveringly, undoubtedly just been like, oh yeah, like, of course they would tell me to do this. Ooh. Right. And then you go and you make that decision. Sure. Um, That's so good. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it really is. And look, to go back to the little things, so you, you know how many people are walking around and they don't know why they don't have confidence. And I'll ask them like, and, and not from a place of judgment because I ain't perfect either, but like, it's like, is, is your house clean? Is your car clean? You know, like, are you hitting the gym every day? Like, especially like a man, like, do you have belly fat? Do you got a beer belly? You, you, so hold on, you're sitting in front of me and you're saying, I wonder why I don't have confidence and you aren't in the best fucking shape of your life. And by the way, you control that 100%. This is where I trigger men. Oh, but Kayla, I got three jobs. I'm, I'm, Kids. I'm providing for my family and infl- I literally will post about this stuff and people will say, but what about inflation? <laughs> and it's like, sorry, you're blaming inflate. Yeah. Because then I got to work three jobs. I don't have time to work out. No, no, no. Mm. You can't afford to not be in the best shape of your life right now. Agreed. Okay. Go get a six pack or go get in the best shape of your life. And then come back to me and tell me you don't have more confidence. How's your house? Is it clean? You know, 
Do you floss your teeth? Do you brush your teeth before you go to bed? For the longest time, I struggled to brush my teeth before I went to bed. Okay. I knew in my head sure. that that was, and it sounds so silly, right? But I struggled for so long to brush my teeth before I went to bed because it's just like for some reason, you know, I was just tired. I would lay on the couch and I, I would negotiate with myself. Should I, should I not? <laughs> sure. Until I realized that all those little things that sound so silly and people are going to attack me on this, like, oh, here's another, you know, personal growth guru telling me that me brushing my teeth is going to build me confidence. Well, if that's your take on it, like, and, and you don't think those things matter or they add up, then keep going down that direction and let me know how it works for you. But look at all, how's your bank account? Right? Are you doing things that will um, create wealth mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially in your life? Like, are you showing up for yourself and building a stack of undeniable proof that you are who you say you are, or are you not? Look at all these little things and then stop wondering why you don't have confidence. You don't have confidence because you're not showing up. So good. Yeah. You, listen, if uh, if anyone's listening to this and you can't find gold out of out of what Kayler's saying right now. Like, you don't want it. Like, you don't want to hear this. And that's probably the reason. But if you're just just a little bit open to, to advancing your position in life, this is actually how it happens. We all think that it's some magical piece of information that's going to make us rich. No, it's all the stuff that Kayler's talking about compounded over a lifetime. It's really set your focus and on, on all the little details that sort of gear you to be a person that I would trust. Actually, no, no, no. That a person that has opportunity to give would trust. And that is really important. People miss this. And, and I, before I, I hit this next point, because you teed it up so beautifully, I want to slip in one more lesson that I, I think is, 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 is such an alignment with what you're talking about. And that is just reframing the problem quickly, fast. Like take yourself out of the equation because you're not that smart and you make bad decisions and your, your track record shows that you're not worth listening to. So reframe the anxiety, reframe the stress, reframe the position with the dragon and say, well, what would Brave do right now? I just put it like to that. Brave has a totally different answer than I do. What would Courage do? How does Courage handle this problem? Like these are like simple ways to sort of like get out of your own way. So I call it bold courageous, consistent action. It's BCCA. Those are the building blocks of winning, just like BCAAs, the building blocks of muscle. But what would bold do? What would courage do? What would consistency do? And what would action do? How would action solve this paralyzing thought? That simple framework, as simple as it is, BCCA can absolutely change your life because it will change small moments. It'll change the outcomes in real time. Um, so I wanted to just leave that because I thought it was it teed up so perfectly with what you just said, Kaylor. But where I was hoping to lead was 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 this idea of proximity to power, proximity to people that are like you, people proximity to people that have overcome the hump of sort of letting their emotions make decisions in their life, being able to control the controllables in such a beautiful way that allows for momentum to start showing up in someone's life. Um, and again, like that, even, even that last sort of framework of bold, courageous, consistent action, like as that shows up for you, likely what's happening is now you are attracting that right back. You're attracting the people that operate their lives that way. I'll, I'll, I'll tee it up like this. When I started really winning in life, the first thing that started happening was I exposed everyone that was around me. It became so clear that when I made a standard change and a decision change, it exposed my natural environment, including family and, and close friends. Like everything around me was exposed. And in fact, if you listen to those people, they instantly will suck you right back down. So that was really important distinction in this evolution of real transformation and growth. As I started seeking out people that were doing what I want to do, people that I admired, figuring out how to bring value into their worlds and, and really sort of connect, what I realized over the last 15 years in my story, this has been a constant evolution of, of, of just acquiring some of the most incredible relationships, friendships, almost like some of them could be like family to me, but always for people that are doing a hell of a lot more than me. And where I'm leading this is, is it was through osmosis, like absorbing of their energy of, that became so powerful. And I argue that I actually am a collection of countless of the greatest men and women I've ever like put my heart into that I've ever like really broke bread with. Like I take little pieces of them that like I adopt that work for me kind of on accident. I don't even know that I'm manually doing it. But that is the power of proximity. I don't know if you would add to that, but this has been so big in my life. And what I realize, people that don't win, they hang around with people that don't win. And that's a problem. This is one of the most powerful 
aspects of winning. It is uh, one of the foundational principles. You know, we live in a society, and I'm just going to call a spade a spade. Most people listening who are not, in fact, I would say all people who are listening who are not where they want to be are overeducated underachievers, mm. overeducated underachievers. We live in an information world <laughs> so now good. and it's, we're just on Instagram all the time and we're just like consuming all this information. They know what they need to do and they're falling for the delusion that them watching another Ted talk, so listening to another podcast, reading another book is actually getting them somewhere. And in actuality, you're just avoiding the work that scares you the most, mm. the real work. Okay. So it's to, Understand that the most powerful thing you can do is to surround yourself with instead of overeducated underachievers, it's to surround yourself with educated overachievers. Okay, that's who I look to surround myself with. You know, if you go back in the day, let's say, Eric, me and you both know sales, right? I've studied sales for a long time, over a decade now. It's um, one of my greatest skills that increases my value in the marketplace that has allowed me to, um, you know, elevate my life in so many different ways. But if you look at back in the day before the internet, what would have someone done to learn sales? Well, they would have gotten probably a mentor if they were smart, someone who knows the game and yeah, they would learn from that mentor. They'd probably go to the library or the bookstore and buy a few books and they'd read books. But disproportionately, they would go knock on fucking doors action. and sell yeah, action. action. Yeah. That is how you learn any skill in the most optimal way. Okay. Yes, I'm not I'm not saying you don't educate yourself, but at the end of the day, disproportionately you got to go out and take action. What do we do now if someone wants to learn sales? They buy every book and they sit there and read. They listen to podcasts all day long. They join a, yet another program, which I'm not against, by the way. You should. They get another mentor. They go from program to program to program. They watch the TED Talks on sales. They learn about psychology. And they, they learn, they learn, they learn, they learn. And then they take a little bit of action, right? It's because, again, you are deluded into thinking that that is actually getting you somewhere when in actuality it's just the comfortable work is to learn. Get your ass out there and actually do it. Again, educated overachievers. So what you want to do, and you know what makes it a lot easier to do that, is to go out and surround yourself with people who are actually uh, exemplifying the courage to step out and actually take the action, which is the best way to learn. Now, the last thing I'll add to that is I'm pretty ruthless. Um, if someone, if I recognize that someone is not helping me and, you know, getting on this roller coaster ride and growing with me and elevating my life to a higher place, and isn't someone who's open to going out and taking action, um, talking about solutions and ideas and amazing visions that, you know, we have. And instead, they're talking about people or they're complaining or just doing these low vibe activities. I'm going to distance myself from them, even if I've been friends with them since I was knee high to a grasshopper. OK, I am. I'm going to. And people get tripped up on this. People are like, what? You're just saying drop people. Yeah, life's too short, man. Like, the, like you can't afford to not drop those people and surround yourself with better. But here's what I'll add that I think helps that. It's not a pretentious thing, okay? I believe in approximately, you don't have to have it to a T, but about a third, a third, a third, okay, when it comes to your network. So a third of people should be people that are... Um, overachievers, educated overachievers, and they're going to stretch you to a level that you didn't even think was an imag imaginable level. You mentioned Ed Milet as your mentor. Someone like Ed Milet would fit into that category. Okay, that guy must stretch your belief of what's actually possible that's for yourself. Here. And that guy, that's why you're here. That's and here. that guy is making shit happen. Okay, so a third of the people that you surround yourself, I believe should be in that category. A third of the people should be around your level, but again, focused on achieving, right? They're your comrades. They're people that you can bounce ideas off each other. They're going to help your confidence, right? They're going to affirm that what you're doing is the right thing, and they're going to be more relatable as well, too. And then the last third should be people that you're actually mentoring, 
I love it. Right? People that are actually below you in this ladder that we call, you know, achievement and leveling up, right? In that they are earlier on on their journey. And one of the best ways to learn is to teach. And it will also add a ton of fulfillment in your life and meaning, right? Because at the end of the day, we are here to serve and be useful to others. So I like the third, a third, a third rule. And then it doesn't come from this like pretentious place. Like I'm too good for you. It's not about that. This is so good. I've always said for like the last 10 years, I'm only in two rooms. I'm in a room where someone's pulling me up or I'm in a room where I'm around people that want to be pulled up, but they got to want it. Yeah. And I love, you know, you just did a better job at sort of breaking it out, but you're, you're dead on because where I actually found meaning and purpose, it didn't happen until I was 35, it, the process. It was really Ed Milet. It's funny you, you, you mentioned him, but my grandma passed away at 35 and I was on top of the world, had everything. The dream life, I had checked all these fucking boxes. And I was leveraging, watch me, watch me, watch me. See me winning, see me winning. Hey, Dad, I'm winning, you see? Winning, like, I chips on my shoulder got me very far. Like, I'm going to become someone. But it was after I came out of hell. So when I started winning and then it compounded quick, I was in the right market, right time, right investments, a lot of luck also. But I had it all, and my grandma died, and that's when I started questioning what the meaning of life was, and I got really sick almost, like a year of obsessing over death in the wrong way. But it somehow guided me to the right person, and that right person happened to be Ed, but I, I, I've been making this case when the right person asks the right question at the right time, your life can change. And for the first time in my life, someone stared right through who I actually was. They literally saw right through me. I never felt so small in my life. And he asked me just a series of questions, questions that really led up to this idea of what's your purpose? Who the fuck are you? No, no, really, who are you? And why are you here? And I had no good answers for anything he asked at that point in my life. I wasn't living in the light. I was too scared of it. I told myself a weird story about that. I had all these things and he was the one that says, no, you're not, I'm not gonna challenge you to do this. You are gonna do this. You're gonna do this for the rest of your life. You're too talented. You have too much heart. You have too much soul. You are going to do this. Like it was such a forceful thing and I'm glad he did it because when I started stepping in the light, that was that piece that I was always missing. I slowly started finding purpose. I, start, I slowly started revealing the racket that I've been running my whole life, and I st- fully started really fully being proud of who I was because I realized this is where my highest and best use actually is, is out there helping people. And actually, instead of being mad at the TV, it's actually doing something about it, and it's really given me such a peace in my heart that I've never had. Um, very powerful, I think, in my story, sort of how purpose entered and why it entered and where, where peace actually entered. Like true peace is, is, is I think something that's really powerful, but it didn't start out that way. I just love sort of the evolution of man. And, and if you study it and it's really powerful, but now Taylor, someone can come, you know, get in my world, invest in my world, be near me. And I would argue that, or your world, I would argue those could be some of the best investments for a young person that's hungry, that is wanting to skip steps, but I will argue, just like you said, it's not the information. If they hold your cell phones up, everyone listening right now, hold this up. You have the entire world in your hand. Every piece of information that's ever been collected since the beginning of mankind is right in your palm of your hands. You know how lucky we are to have access to this kind of resource? This is like God in your hand in a sense. And so why are people losing so bad? And the crazy part, Kaylor, to sort of back all this up is the statistics don't lie. Right now in America, in America, two thirds of Americans couldn't come up with a thousand dollars if their life depended on it. Like the mindset of this country is is, is wretched. I just saw this on Fox Business the other morning. It said that 60% of Gen Zers think that they'll never be able to afford a house in their entire life. That's mindset. Who is teaching these people? What is happening to children? And then even worse, CDC, CDC statistics of all places shows the health of teenage girls in this country, and it makes my heart sick. I have two teenage nieces that I adore, and the amount of suicide, the amount of thoughts of suicide, the amount of depression, the amount of children that are planning suicide, like the depths of this, the numbers would make you mad. They would make you sick to your stomach. And so the more profound question that maybe we can wrap this up with is like, why is this happening? Like, what is the incentive from the powers above at that sort of that first tier that you mentioned like, why are they so destructive at really, I think, going after sort of innocence in a way that I, I never thought I'd see in my life? I believe it's because everything we've talked about in this conversation, not to suggest that 
we don't have shortcomings or flaws or that I don't have blind spots. I'm not saying I have all the answers, but everything we've talked about in this episode, Eric, is very fundamental to, to winning. And it's, it's pretty basic stuff. But you want to know why we're in this position, why children are in such a very scary place and it's so unfortunate as well too it 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 it, it could it makes me so incredibly sad to mm-hmm. think about is it's because the establishments the media the government just society in general would be offended by most of what we just said they would like we're talking about like ditching people that don't lift you higher we're talking about um you know unraveling the story of who you believe yourself to be and actually show up and like, you know, to not just sit around and hold hands and sing Kumbaya all day long and to not, um, to not play it small, to not go get the safe job that you think is so safe, but in actuality is actually the biggest risk. Like people will just be offended by that. Like I look at someone like, you know, look, not to make this political, but like someone like a Kamala Harris who, you know, could potentially be the leader of of America, the commander in chief. Mm-hmm. And I look at someone like her and, you know, no kids, right? Um, tiptoes around feelings. Everything is about feelings. You know, we just talked about how winning is actually to be able to not be driven by your feelings. Now, it's not that emotions don't matter. Okay, one of my favorite quotes is just because your feelings are valid, it doesn't mean they should dictate your behavior. Mm. That's what it all comes down to. People like a Kamala Harris, if I can make this a little bit political, Please. because I think it's so relevant, you know, to like the fact that we are probably going to have half of America and, you know, Canada as well, too. We got Justin Trudeau, <laughs> like half of our countries are listening to these people and getting sold that you should actually make decisions based off your feelings. And instead, what I say is your feelings are valid. Acknowledge them, create space for them, hold them, but do not let them drive you all the time, okay? When you're having a heart-to-heart with your friend, yeah, okay, you can let your emotions drive you, right? You said that if you were to see me and we were in a special moment, you'd probably hold on to me a little longer and and hug it out that's also part of being a man is to actually be able to hold space for emotions and and not be afraid to express them but when it comes to actually creating the life that you want and showing up in this world and you said like why the fuck are you here like when it comes to defining that and then aligning your behavior to it Mm -hmm. if you allow yourself to be driven by your feelings you are absolutely going to get to a place where life will fucking break you. Okay, truly, I believe the difference between, you know, some of these people who have achieved a lot of success, you look at like an Ed Milet, or Donald Trump, let's say, could you imagine? Could you imagine what these guys have to go through on a daily basis? Like, they are getting judged, criticized, abandoned, rejected, shamed, constantly. They have fires in their businesses, they're, they're waking up one day and they just lost $10 $10 million because of, you know, a stock that that went down or something like or, or a piece of real estate that they have or, you know, whatever, like lawsuits, character assassination, like literally a, a hit on their life. Like, you know, Trump literally became within like half an inch of of yeah. actually having his life end, you know, like, can you just imagine what these guys go through? And here's the thing. The difference between people who actually show up and actually are aligning their behavior with why the fuck they're really here, the difference between them and people who are asleep and not getting what they want and losing in life, difference is is that they've shown up for themselves for so long that they can handle an amount of adversity and stress that would break the average person. Now, they're not any different. I honestly don't believe Ed Milet is any different. I know Ed Milet's story. He talks about how he was so broke that one day they couldn't even shower because their water got turned off, right? And he was with his now same wife that he has right now. Like, I know a little bit about his story. Ed Milet was not always a rock star. But one day he made the decision to align his behavior with being a rock star. And that takes courage. 
And then slowly but surely with enough repetition, he did that. And then he got enough evidence that made him build the resilience to be able to handle an amount of stress and adversity that life inevitably throws at you that would break most people. So to go back to your question, why are our children in, in such a dangerous place? Because they're being sold a lie, a lot of lies. And the lie is, is that they should do all the opposite of what we're saying in this episode. Yeah. Do the safe thing, do the comfortable thing. Your emotions matter the most. It's like, no, your emotions serve a purpose, hold space and acknowledge them. But the thing you got to master is your behavior. Mm. Yeah, I agree. One, one last little thought here, because I know we have a hard stop coming up, but I just listened to a buddy of mine. He had a podcast with uh, on with uh, Robert O'Neill, the guy that shot um, Osama bin Laden. And I met, I met him a few times um, at a few different events, but... Um, it was interesting to sort of hear him answer this question. And he, without a blink of an eye, he said China. And he says, you know, China's been really good at one thing historically. They, it's, like a, it's like an ancient art um, of war that's kind of unique is they'll go across the river, they'll sneak across the river in the middle of the night, and they'll start a little fire. And they'll sneak back over, and they'll just sit patiently and watch that fire slowly start to grow. And we'll watch the chaos happen and ensue and he goes that's exactly what china is good at that that's really a long game and they've done it through tiktok and he goes they're killing america's children by making their mind mush through tiktok and so the reason i decided to bring it up because i didn't want to open up a huge topic at the end because this is a massive one and especially for someone like you i know it is but i want to cap it the end of this with maybe a point to that is that is why it is so important for for men to step up to the plate the, the thing that might put that fire out potentially is I think collectively is, is every good man with good intention and good heart, stand up and say something. Stand up for what is right, convicted in your soul, and really like be aware, awaken to what is actually happening to America's children. And maybe we can sort of put a plug in this thing in a way that like will we'll really have some substantial sort of outcome that is worthwhile. But that's what I hope to inspire in everyone on beyond just winning, getting what you want out of life um, is really understanding that there's a greater purpose, maybe more now than ever, for good men to, to not sit and do nothing. Because I think when good men do nothing, evil triumphs. And this may be like a, a, a testing uh, you know, place in, in, our, in our history, which is very short, by the way. Um, you know, that in that Joe Rogan quote just still kind of rings in my head. I don't think he created it. I think he popularized it. That would good... Um, men like you know operate like good times happen when hard men operate good times happen but when bad men start to operate weak men weak bad times start to happen and if we're there maybe we can all like align right now our forces and if you can wake that up in people Taylor which I think you're doing that's incredible I too want to wake that up in people um, and I challenge any listeners to wake that up in people, any influence that you have, any power that you have, like now's the time to, to really step up to the plate. And I hope people feel this message. Well, and just to add to that, you're, you're bang on with that. Here, here's the deal. If I was king of the world and I was evil and I wanted to make the population weak, particularly men, I would focus on men um, because those are the ones that can revolt uh exactly. the, the strongest and they're most aggressively so what i would do is i would make them weak by selling them the fact that they can be women <laughs> and that masculinity is evil i would take away their meat i would tell them that working out is a far right extreme ideology All that, yeah. i would make them think that i'm the enemy so that they point their finger and give their power to me and then they give up their responsibility. I would get them to also believe that their neighbor is the enemy as well too. So they just sit around and fight with their enemy. I would also give them something, you mentioned China, I would give them something at their fingertips that just lights the, the pleasure centers up of their brain, you know, nonstop Point. and actually is meaningless. Okay, but really over time, you know, doesn't fulfill them or make them stronger. And I would also um, encourage a comfortable lifestyle. I would, I would discourage them from taking risk and I would just simply get them to depend on me. So I would, I would want them to accept money from me and handouts and checks 
because that's a crutch and that makes them even more weak as well too. I could go on, but you know, it sounds kind of familiar, doesn't no, it? No, it does. Get them to hate their country. Get them to question the the, the true nature of history and, and the progression of real freedom. All that. It, it it's also profound, you know. And and at the same time, let's go after these kids too, which are the future voters of this country. Let's kind of enslave these young mindsets. Get them to hate their country and get them to really disalign from their parents. Uh, there's a lot of weird stuff going on right now, man. I'm good. There's, I'm glad there's courage and, and that more people are stepping up to the plate. And uh, I feel I've been called to it. I know you're called to it. And I hope more people out there feel called to this. They're going to step up and try to make that voice and that power of what they offer the world like felt. Thanks, Eric. I, uh, man, I, I have such a fun time jamming with you. And I, I <laughs> man, if, if we, if we honestly just with this episode, if we even just maybe touch like one person, uh, I'm sure there'll be more, but even just one person, if this kind of is the the nuggets that allow them to change the trajectory of their lives, I mean, yep. this is why I do this, Huge. man. Like, yeah, listen, when you have ownership and leverage in life, you have you have you have a little bit of power, and and, and I we want you to get to the highest levels of power in life, so that you can you can use that power for good. Because if you don't have real power, it's really going to hard for you to make a dent. Although you even a little helps. But the more you have, the more profound your, your mark on the world can be. And so that should be an incentive enough to get really powerful in life, get really financially secure, get really wealthy, so that you can go out and have really powerful influence on the world. It's one of the things that I always challenge people, when, especially guys that I see that have a lot of potential. I say, hey, when you go get crazy rich and you, and you take over the world, make sure you use the power for good. Do not get Hollywood. Do not lose sight of what matters. Do not lose sight of God. Like, make sure you stay humble, stay grounded, and use that power for good. Make sure you enter the gates of heaven correct. And um, <clears throat> that's my message. Per- Pray like it's up to God and work like it's all up to you. Mm, love that. What's, that's a good one to end on. Well, I appreciate you, Kayla. We'll, uh, we'll definitely have to have you back for part two because we never even got in your story, but I think people can feel who you are and know that there's something really powerful in there. If we want to send people to you, to follow you, to work with you, connect with you, where should we send them? Yeah, go to, yeah, go to just, just the Kaylor, Kaylor Betts, Betts on Instagram. That's the K A Y L O R B E T T S. You can check me out on Instagram. You know, that'll lead you to the Awake and Winning podcast, which Eric was on, and we had an unbelievable conversation. People loved that one. By the way, we got great feedback. So yeah, that's where people can check me out. Amazing. Grateful for you, man. So for you guests out there that are, that are watching the show, please like the show. This thing can't grow. We, our message can't spread if you guys don't help us. So thank you for listening. Go follow Kaler and make sure you, you like, share, and, uh, and subscribe to the show. We'll see you next time. Thank you.